Prayer is an important part of our Christian lives, but sometimes we might wonder how we should pray. Maybe we wonder what sort of things we should pray about, or maybe we wonder how we should pray about things that we want to pray about. What if we could listen in on some of the key people in the Bible and hear the sorts of things they said when they prayed? Well, in some cases, it happens that we can, because in a number of different places, there are prayers recorded in the Bible, and that includes a few in the letters of Paul. The book of Ephesians has two different prayers. Um, they're found in chapter 1, verse 15 to 19, and chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. There are two good reasons for looking at these prayers. Firstly, they can teach us a number of different things. And as we read through these passages, we'll be looking at the sorts of things Paul prays about and why these are important. The other big reason why it's good to study these prayers is that they're actually very good things for us to pray ourselves. Although we don't have to be tied to using written prayers, those that are recorded in the Bible can be very helpful. If Paul thought that these things were important to pray for the Christians in Ephesus, then they are really things that we can and should be praying for ourselves and for others. Let's look at this first prayer, and as I read it, try to identify the things that Paul is mentioning. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. When I was trying to summarise this, the points that I came up with were knowing God and his love better, knowing the hope that we're called to, and knowing God's power. Now, before we think about why these things might be important, I'd just like to show you that the second prayer actually covers very similar themes. Listen out for the similarities as I read uh, the second passage, which is Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. It's useful to know that when Paul starts this prayer, he says that he kneels. This doesn't mean that we have to kneel when we pray, but it does indicate an attitude of humility and reverence. We read elsewhere in the New Testament that we can come to God boldly, but we still do this with humility because it's only through God's mercy and through Jesus' sacrifice for us that we're able to come to God boldly. Also, this prayer is in response to something that was said earlier in the letter. He starts off with the phrase, for this reason. And when we trace this back, we can find that the reason is actually found at the end of chapter 2. It's all the things that we were looking at last week about the good news of the gospel, um, how God is reconciling us to himself through Jesus. And having a deeper understanding of these things should inspire reverence and awe. So let's look at the main themes of those prayers. In chapter 1 verse 17, Paul prays that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Other translations like the ESV put it as a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We need to know about God, but it's just as important that we get to know him personally. You can't get to know someone without learning some things about them, but you can very easily learn a load of things about a person without actually getting to know them. The Bible tells us a lot about God, but the reason for that is to draw us closer to him so that we can actually get to know him for ourselves. 
God loves us and it's his desire that we should love him in return. And there has to be more to that than just an intellectual knowledge of how his love is described. That's why Paul prays in in chapter 3 verse 17 that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. The main way God expresses his love for us is in his willingness to forgive us. As we saw last week, it was because of his great love for us that God was willing to make us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. The writer of Psalm 103 has this to say about God's love. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So God expresses his love in forgiveness, and the greatest demonstration of this is in Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, it was to take the punishment for all our sin, and it was because of his love for us that he was willing to do this. We can get so used to hearing that that it starts to lose its impact on us, And that's why we need to keep praying that God would show us and and help us to know his love for ourselves. Because when we really understand it and know it, that will change the way we live. We will respond in a deeper love for God, and that then spills over into the way we love other people. Paul also talks about knowing the hope to which God has called you, the glorious riches of his inheritance in his holy people. The good news of the gospel is not just about our lives here and now, but it's about a hope that God gives us for the future. One day God's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth, he's going to wipe away all evil and all his people will spend eternity with him. This is our hope, this is where we're heading, but it can become all too easy to lose sight of this plan for the future. But if we keep this hope in mind, it changes our outlook on life now. It should change our priorities. And also this is not just some kind of vague hope, like a sort of wishful thinking. This is based on promises from God. So it can give us security through the problems and struggles that we face. Finally, let's think about God's power. Paul prays that the Ephesians would know God's incomparably great power for us who believe. And he says that this power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Later, Paul ends his second prayer by saying, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations for ever and ever. Amen. This is an expression of praise, but it's also intended to teach us something. Paul wants us to see how great God's power is. Part of this is his power to save us. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, we can have the assurance that we too will be raised and spend eternity with God when we put our trust in Jesus Christ. As well, God's power is displayed in the way that he changes us. As we thought about last week, we are God's workmanship or God's masterpiece. God is the craftsman making us into new creations by the power of his Holy Spirit. And that's so that the glory goes to him. We can't take the credit for that. When Paul uses these expressions, incomparably great and immeasurably more, these are really supposed to help to build our faith in God. If we could grasp how great God's power is, then we would trust him more and not doubt that he is able to answer. Right at the start of his first prayer, Paul states that he keeps asking these things. 
these are things that we need to keep asking. Because no matter how long we've been following Jesus or how much we know, we can always get to know God better and there's always more that we can know of his love and his power. So now let's use these verses to close in prayer. Father God, we pray that you would give us revelation through your Holy Spirit to help us to know you better. Open the eyes of our hearts to know and understand the hope you have called us to. We pray that you would strengthen us through your Holy Spirit, that Christ would dwell in our hearts as we put our faith in him. May we be rooted and established in your love and help us to grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is and to know this love personally. And we pray that you would help us to know your incomparably great power, that you can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. To you, Lord God, be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen.